Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is where we look at that most fabulous genre of fiction, steampunk, and also consider the wider world of science fiction and fantasy. Now, one of the things I've noticed that people love on the internet is top ten lists, and so do I, and so I do a lot of lists too. But one list I have not done yet, until now, is top ten sci-fi novels of all time, of any subgenre, including steampunk. And that was very difficult. I had to think about it for quite some time, but I finally managed. So I think you might be very interested in seeing what they are and how I've made a couple choices that are a little different than people might expect. Started, I'd like to do a quick poll because I'd like to see what, what people like to see. I do want people to watch these things and so if I'm going to put in the work of doing them I like to see what people want to see. So what would you what do you like best of all these four categories? A. Uh, reviews of specific books or movies or anime whatever. B. Lists like this one top ten, bottom ten, whatever. C. Uh, topics exploring Themes in science fiction such as robots and dragons, and which I've done recently. Or D, historical background uh, videos such as the one on the Crystal Palace in London and, and its huge role in steampunk. So, let's continue. To do any kind of list, any kind of top ten of anything, you have to determine your parameters. Because this is such a difficult choice and such a wide field, I had to narrow it down a bit. Uh, number one, I decided not to include a Victorian sci-fi because it's such a different animal. It's like comparing apples and oranges. And at some point, I will do a top ten of 19th century science fiction. Second criteria I put in there is that uh, that would not include any collections of related stories, which are sometimes included in novel collections, such as uh, Ray Bradbury's the Martian Chronicles. Uh, they are very, very uh, interrelated and interlocked, so it kind of hangs together. But for my purpose of a novel, I'll consider it to be a one, kind of a one-piece thing or a one, uh, one arc thing. So number ten, The Gods Themselves by Isaac Asimov, by Doubleday, 1972, won the Hugo and the Nebula Awards, and most people pick. As the most foundation series, I didn't. I think it's a little long and dry. Uh, this one was Asimov's favorite book that he wrote of the many hundreds, and uh, I love it because it portrays a completely alien species in a in a totally weird alternate dimension. And its plot involves this weird discovery by an Earthling physicist who finds that this element appears that shouldn't exist. And he realizes that it's come from an alternate dim dimension, and here in our dimension it decays rapidly, producing energy. And so he invents this thing called the pump that produces an inexhaustible supply of very, very cheap energy for Earth, which it badly needs. But 25 years later, a, another physics researcher uh, discovers the danger because he finds, he and his friends find that there are messages being sent by these aliens to say, please stop it. <laughs> and so it turns out that these aliens, they, their universe is very fluid. They have three sexes. They experience time differently. Uh, all these bizarre things about them. And, and they have uh, this scientist who is actually composed of three beings who are tr trying to keep the earthlings from doing this because it's going to make their sun explode. <laughs> And it's going to endanger the whole galaxy on our side, too. So it's, it's kind of gripping. There's this danger, and there's this fascinating portrayal of a very alien culture, which, it portray, which shows you how brilliant Asimov was. Number nine, Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin, published in 1969 by Ace Books. She won the Hugo and the Nebula for this, and this is the sole woman on this list of my list. 
and she's more, better known for her fantasy, including the Earthsea novels. This one is on every list because it's considered to be feminist. <laughs> Although by today's standards, it's considered to be retrograde, because particularly because there's no gay people in it. Oh, too bad. <laughs> the whole idea is that there's this world where humans are uh, basically hermaphroditic, every one of them. And so, you know, the idea of homosexuality kind of doesn't work, <laughs> or, or else everybody is. But humans are essentially asexual until they have this, basically, uh, mating cycle, and then they can manifest as male or female, depending upon random factors. And so, which makes their society very interesting and bizarre. And the story itself involves a uh, Terran ambassador sent there to try to uh, influence these people of planet Gethin, it's called, to join the Federation. And they have feuding factions there, and he is involved in all this um, con conflict, and he's kidnapped and held prisoner, and, and uh, forms tight friendships with some of these Gethinians. And it's memorable less for the plot as for the way these people interact. And the characters are actually pretty good, too. Uh, number eight, Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson. Another one that doesn't appear on too many lists. It's actually a part of a trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. And uh, Red Mars was published in 2003 by Spectra, uh, for which he won the BSFA and that's British Science Fiction, and Nebula Awards. And his uh, the other two in the trilogy also won lots of awards. And this trilogy involves the human colonization and terraforming of what? Mars! And it starts in 2026 with the first colonial voyage. Again, like, a, like I'll say many times, we're way behind on this timeline, people! There's a long sweep of time with hundreds of characters, so it's hard to single any out, but some of them are pretty, pretty outstanding. And uh, one of the things that happens is that people realize that Mars is terraformable and they're going to make it livable for humans. But, and those people are called greens, but the preservationists, they're called reds, because they want Mars to stay red. And uh, so there's some conflict, you know, with sometimes they're radicals and trying to blow up some of the, some of the stuff that the, uh, the more progressive greens are using to transform Mars. So it's, it's the technology is fascinating, and the, the sweep of the characters, and uh, all, the, all the different... Um, conflicts with Earth, including the corporations that are trying to control everything. And uh, an interesting note, a friend of mine who is a planetary geologist uh, thinks that uh, the timeline, the 200-year timeline is ridiculous, ridiculously short, that is. But nonetheless, it's a very great series, and so I think it definitely belongs on the list. Number seven, The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling, which is the only collaboration on this list. And this was published in 1990 by Victor Gallantz. And normally, I don't know about Sterling, but normally Gibson's on the list for his cyberpunk book Neuromancer, which was good, but I don't know. I don't think it aged as well. as I, I, Cyberpunk seems a little weird and dated these days, surprisingly enough. Um, so... This is one of the seminal steampunk books <laughs> made by these two luminaries in the cy cyberpunk world. It's a plausible alternative history where the British Empire is even more powerful because they chose to champion technology rather than tradition. And the U.S. splits up in the Civil War, so it's not a power. And Charles Babbage, who was a real person, invented this mechanical computer. In this case, it's not a curiosity. It's successful, so Britain becomes a leader in information technology. The plot itself involves political intrigue with several characters, many of whom are historical, some aren't, aren't and they're looking for this uh, secret computer program. That they think you can win a fortune in gambling. They look, it'll tell you how to win at gambling, but it's way more important than that. It's way more significant than that. And it's going to change the future of mankind. And I love how there's a lot of historical characters like Sam Houston and Lord Byron who have different uh, roles, and Charles Darwin is the PM of of Britain. This was on my top 10 steampunk list, but it is also on my top 10 sci-fi of all time list. Number six, The Wind-Up Girl by Paolo Basacalupi. He's actually from Colorado. <laughs> and from western Colorado, where 
spent a lot of time in that part of the world. And this was published in 2009 by Nightshade Books. And even though it was kind of a minor publisher, it got all these awards. Nebula, Hugo, Campbell, and Locus Awards, among others. And it was his first book, his first novel. And he hasn't written a lot, but if they're like this, they, they, this was fantastic in my view. And I first encountered it on a list of steampunk books, but it's not. It's, it's almost cyberpunk in the sense that it's futuristic and kind of dystopian. Uh, other people call it biopunk, which is a dumb category that doesn't have enough books to <laughs> fill it, so <laughs> I won't call it that. It's, it's a future uh, 23rd century uh, and takes place in Thailand, of all places. And I guess I guess uh, Basakalupi has a degree in East Asian Studies, and I assume he's probably spent some time over there, because it really sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And there's all this climate change trouble, uh, raising oceans, and there's the deal about running out of fossil fuels. Because of that, they've invented these mainsprings of this engineered material, and uh, those that's how most things are powered, uh, hence the wind-up part. And there are these giant agribusiness companies, kind of like the evil Monsanto. <laughs> I wouldn't get canceled for saying that, but I do believe they're evil. And uh, they are trying to dominate the whole world by having these patented seeds so that, so that everybody depends upon their seeds to be fed. And, uh, and Thailand is the only country, because they have a far-sighted royal family, and they're the only country that's refused, and they have natural seeds. Uh, at the same time, they have genetically engineered elephants who wind up these springs, so go figure. The titular character, the wind-up girl, is a artificial human from Japan, abandoned there by her owner because she's artificial, uh, basically a sex doll, human sex doll, and because she's artificial human, she's illegal in Thailand, so if they catch her, they'll kill her. And uh, it involves her and this American representative of one of these uh, agribusiness companies who's trying to infiltrate Thailand, and some of the heroic Thais who are fighting back, including, I remember there was a character who was like an honest bureaucrat who was actually had been like some kind of MMA fighter. <laughs> uh, I may be confusing two characters, but in any case, they're very cool. And so anyway, the wind-up girl, her Emiko is her name, she's called wind-up because for whatever reason, the Japanese engineered in this weird kind of gait that she had, like she uh, she kind of moves like a clockwork toy. And, and that's kind of so they can distinguish these between real humans, but it's, it makes it very dangerous for her because it makes her obvious. Great book, uh, and uh, highly recommend it. Number five, 2001, A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. And... Uh, 1968 Hutchinson and the new, and new the new American Library in America. This book was written at the same time as the film, which was basically commissioned by Kubrick. He wanted Clark to write something about this. And usually people will cite Clark's novel Childhood's End as his best. Uh, I disagree. I think that was a bit pretentious. I think this one is better, and because I, I love the, how it does a sweep of human evolution as influenced by aliens. And... Uh, so the book was kind of overshadowed by the movie, which did win an Academy Award and is considered one of the best ever. For those of you who don't recall the movie or haven't seen it, God forbid, uh, it starts in prehistoric Africa, where these ape men encounter this obelisk that gives them the power to think. There's several chapters in the book, there's several chapters of this, which explain how it's done, which I like. Then it goes to the modern world, where we have a moon base in 2001, which we should have, we really should have if we hadn't concentrated on war instead of space exploration like, like normal, rational people would. And uh, they also find an obelisk in the Tycho Crater, which is sending a beacon towards Saturn. In the book, it's Saturn. In the movie, it's Jupiter. Why? Because Clark didn't like the way they were drawing Saturn's rings, the, the, the animators, the CGI people. And this was, remember, this was way back around 1970, so, <laughs> before 1970, so, anyway, that's why they changed Jupiter, but and that's why they had the mission in the story to go to that planet to see what was out there. And, of course, we have the, the ship that's run by HAL 9000, and uh, Dave Poole 
and now Frank Poole and Dave Bowman have to contend with this uh, computer that loses its mind. I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. The movie's got the psychedelic ending that people don't understand, ending with the space baby. <laughs> In the book, they explain it very, very much more satisfactorily. And it involves the aliens basically talking into Dave Bowman's mind and all the places they show him and the and uh, the future it hold it holds for human evolution, which is it's pretty inspiring, I think. Number four, and this one had to be in there, of course, Dune by Frank Herbert, 1965 Chilton Books, won both a Hugo and a Nebula. And you notice Chilton is a company that normally publishes uh, auto manuals <laughs> because he couldn't get it published by a sci-fi publisher, which is insane. It's like the idiots that, that turned on the Beatles when, when they first auditioned. Same thing, I bet they were kicking themselves when they realized what a, what a gold mine this was because it spawned this long series of books. Not only Herbert, who died too young, but his son has continued them. And so it's a sprawling ep epic of a far future human uh, feudal empires in space, as most of us know. And there's been the David Lynch movie, which was weird because it was Lynch, and the more recent uh, Villeneuve uh, movie that's become, well, become more of a celebrated thing and ha on, we've only seen half of it so far. And then there was a series on sci-fi that wasn't bad, but uh, it features the Atreides family. They're a noble house and they are good guys because they treat their people well and people love them. And uh, the Harkonnens who are evil and they are cruel and sadistic and their people hate them. <laughs> And, of course, the, the Atreides are, are the uh, victims of a conspiracy by the Harkonnens in conjunction with the Emperor. They are given possession of this spice planet called Arrakis, a.k.a. Dune, uh, which is the only source of the uh, mysterious drug Spice, which allows these navigators, this weird mutated navigators guild, to... Uh, pilot ships between stars. And there is also this uh, scheming uh, society of women called the Bene Gesserit, who are, have this genetic engineering, this eugenics program going on to, to produce this uh, messiah called the Kwisatz Haderach. Of course, at the same time, everybody, everybody else is conspiring, and the Harkonnens assassinate uh, the beloved Duke Leto, Atreides, but his son Paul escapes to the desert, and becomes the messiah uh, of the desert people, the Fremen, who are very much like modern-day Arabs. So it's it's a lot of a lot of excitement and adventure as they battle the evil Imperial and Harkonnen forces. And uh, as I said, it goes on this long series. I've only read like through the fourth, but there's there's tons of these books. Number three. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein, 1966, G.P. Putnam's Sons. And went over Hugo Award. And a lot of people like his Stranger in a Strange Land. I think, though, that his more traditional, a more libertarian book, uh, The Moon, the Harsh Mistress book, is by far his better one. And this is his signature pro-freedom tale of a lunar penal colony uh, in 2075. And they fight for independence against the oppressive regime of the Earth, uh, against overwhelming odds. And the moon has three million people, mostly men, so they they practice plural marriage because there are not enough women. Polyandry, as it's called. And so uh, another factor is, of course, there's children born there who are trapped there because they can't go back because of the low gravity of the moon. They can't survive on Earth. So they're plotting to break free, and, but uh, what gives them an advantage is that they discover this uh, computer scientist called uh, uh, Manuel Garcia O'Kelly Davis, <laughs> ridiculous uh, comp composite name, uh, d discovers that the computer that runs the, plant, the moon's systems is actually sentient. It's achieved consciousness. 
and he makes friends with it and brings it over to their side. He calls him Mycroft because its acronym is Holmes. So Mycroft helps the helps the uh, lunars, or the loonies as they're called, battle the oppressive forces of the earth. Very inspiring, very rah rah. Go go loonies. Number two, here's another one you probably won't have encountered or might not have. A Deepness in the Sky by Werner Vinge, uh, 1999 Tor Books, won a Hugo a Campbell and a Prometheus, which is a libertarian sci-fi award because this is a, another a very libertarian book. And I believe the moon is a harsh mistress won a, a retroactive Prometheus uh, after you know Highland had already passed. Anyway, Back to Werner Vinge. I met the guy once in San Diego, one of the greatest honors of my life, at a convention, very briefly. He's a very smart guy, mathematician. Uh, and usually his book, A Fire Upon the Deep, is put in these lists, but I, I like this one better. It's about this planet that has, it's like an on-off star. It's, it's around, it orbits an on-off star. The star burns, emits energy for 20 years, and then it's cold and dead for 80 years. <laughs> and yet, the planet has life, including intelligent life, which are these giant spiders, or they look like spiders. And as weird as they are, you still feel sympathy for them. You, they really get you to feel like they're people, which they are. And anyway, they, uh, they are discovered by two groups of humans. One is the Chang Ho. They are traders. They, they go around the galaxy in chasing information and inventions and so on, and uh, and they're named after the actual historical Chinese uh, Admiral Cheng Ho, <laughs> uh, and uh, they're the good guys, of course, and the bad guys are this military force from a nearby planet, political cult called the Emergence, which are very fascist, and they have this mind virus that takes over the minds of the Cheng Ho because they want to exploit. Uh, the spider people. And the uh, Cheng Ho have to heroically struggle to free their minds from this control and to fight back these oppressors. Very inspiring, just like uh, number three was. Now before I go to number one, I'm going to have three runners up that I would have liked to put in there, but uh, just didn't have room. Uh, one is Dahlgren by Samuel Ardelany, 1975. He's a black writer, very celebrated, very very interesting, and because it was such an interesting and kind of bizarre book, which is why it sticks with me. Uh, the Three Body Problem, Sitchin Liu uh, from China, uh, published in 2008. Uh, another very fascinating book about uh, humans encountering alien intelligence. However, uh, parts of it were very, very long and a little boring, so the pacing wasn't quite up to snuff. So I didn't include it, but still an outstanding book. And, of course, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, uh, way back in 1953. Kind of dystopian, but I think a little bit more science fiction-y than 1984, for example. And now, without further ado, number one, the best, in my opinion, the best sci-fi novel of all time. Cue the dramatic music. Ta-da! It is Neil Stevenson's the Diamond Age, or A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer, published 1995, Bantam Spectra. And this is also my number one steampunk novel, surprise, surprise, even though it's not usually classified as that. It's also, it's also cyberpunk. Uh, and often they list Stevenson's Snow Crash in, the, in their top 10, top 100 lists. Snow Crash is good, not as good. And Stevenson written, has written a lot of great stuff since, a lot of really fantastic stuff, but a lot of it's actually more historical, uh, historical exploration than um, futuristic, but with a kind of sciencey angle. So any of this stuff is really worth, worth reading. But this, this is the only book I've ever encountered that really fuses cyberpunk and steampunk in one coherent story. It takes place in near future China, which has been split up into two different countries. There's a pro-Western, and I'm not talking about Taiwan here. This is a, this is a pro-Western uh, coastal China republic, which includes Shanghai, and they're very commercial and very outward-facing. Where and there's a isolationist, xenophobic, 
uh, celestial kingdom which is in interior of China. And so most of this takes place in the coastal republic. And in this story, in this world, nanotechnology, which is the science of very small machines, uh, it has solved the problems of scarcity. Most, uh, most of the uh, requirements of life for humans to live and survive can be provided for free uh, from these nanotech assemblers. Even so, there's, you know, even so, there's still discontent <laughs> for whatever reason. I mean, there's still inequality, of course. And, but one of the interesting things that this world of abundance does is it allows people to live in the ways they want. And people tend to associate into these tribes, also called files, which is spelled P-H-Y-L-E, which is kind of like the idea of a phylum in biology. And these tribes have very distinct identities, often ethnic uh, and cultural, included in the, in the Neo-Victorians, which is why I call it steampunk. They live in a very Victorian manner. In fact, they're like us steampunks in the real world, but they can live that life because of nanotechnology and because their people have engineers working on this. So they can have all these fancy homes and uh, real and sometimes artificial horses. <laughs> they live this very manorial, aristocratic lifestyle. And they actually have an artificial island off the coast of China, <laughs> uh, which is where some of this action takes place. And uh, there are other groups like uh, the Ashanti, which is a real-life African tribe. In this world, they have adopted uh, also kind of Victorian mores and modes of dress. And so they're very proper. And uh, they appear briefly um, when uh, some hooligan robs and kills one of them and uh, the whole tribe basically hunts him down and <laughs> makes sure he's ended. <laughs> because that's the other problem of this world is that some people aren't in any tribe and they are called thieves. They're, they're loners, outcasts, whatever, and they're often very uh, down on their luck, uh, the bottom of society. And one of these thieves is a young girl named Nell. And her, as it so happens her her, her mother is single, and the the guy who murders this Ashanti happens to be her mother's no good boyfriend. <laughs> but anyway, as it happens, Nell Nell is very lucky because she gets a copy of this primer, and the primer is an electronic book. It's an interactive tutorial, so to speak, uh, invented or commissioned by this uh, Neo Victorian uh, aristocrat. He's one of the tycoons of their group for his granddaughter, because he wants her to be smart and independent thinker. And the engineer who creates this decides, it's not right to keep this to just one girl. I have to give this to the world, and he does. And one of the people who gets a copy is Nell. And uh, she becomes a very independent young woman. She becomes educated, she gets agency, and she can be heroic. Which is how this, how this transpires, which is very cool. And because there's also a Chinese billionaire who, who wants to save all these girls that have been abandoned because of China's one-child policy. And he does this with the aid of the primer, which he buys from this rogue engineer, and so that he can educate all these girls. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there's some other neat subplots, including this weird cult called the Drummers, who uh, are... Uh, they're like human cells in this uh, mat in this collective consciousness. <laughs> and they have these weird orgies that, that involve uh, co computing uh, different uh, solutions to problems. <laughs> There's always going to be a little bit of weird sex in a, in a Stevenson novel. To be forewarned if you're if you're sensitive about that kind of thing. But I thought this entire novel was one of is probably one of the best, well, definitely one of the best I've ever read. And, and Stevenson is a brilliant writer, and he also, I guess, lectures on nonfiction and technical topics. So this has been my list of the top ten sci-fi novels of all time, at least according to me. Please let me know what your picks might be. <laughs> Let me know in the, in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. It helps us get out the good steampunk word. <laughs> For now, 
This is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.